my dad was the first generation to go to college on either side of my family. And my dad went to the University of Maryland. So my dad, never thinking he would go to grad school, that wasn't on his radar, got a PhD in chemistry. And so moved first of our extended family to move away from where everybody else lived and just had a whole different trajectory. And my parents always valued education. And I think even the plot line, that was just the next thing you do for upward social mm -hmm. mobility. It was modeled for me. And so my sister and I both went that way. You've just heard Ken Barron, professor of psychology at James Madison University. Eric Landrum and guest host Jane Hallinan had the opportunity to sit down with Ken for a conversation in fall of 2023 at STP's annual conference on teaching. Thank you so much to the executive committee of STP and to Lindsay Maslin for making this interview possible and for all of your support over the years. And now without further delay, here is episode 194 of Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. Psych Sessions is sponsored by W.W. W. Norton. Are you looking for more activities to promote scientific literacy? Zaps 3.0 Interactive Labs from W.W. W. Norton are brief, hands-on activities that invite students to actively participate in the process of psychological research and discovery. Utilizing a consistent five-part framework and incorporating transparent design principles, students experience classic psychological studies like the Stroop effect, false memory, the serial position effect, signal detection, and more. Once they've completed the experiment, students can compare their data with national data and their own classmates, offering the opportunity for rich in-class or online discussions. Bring the science of psychology to life for your students with ZAPS. For Psych Sessions listeners new to ZAPS, you can try it for free the next time you teach. Just go to siegel.wwnorton.com forward slash psych sessions. And the folks at WW Norton will even integrate it into your LMS for you. That is Siegel like the bird, S-E-A-G-U-L-L dot wwnorton.com forward slash psych sessions. The Psych Sessions podcast is sponsored by STP. That is the Society for the Teaching of Psychology. That's APA Division 2. You can find them at teachpsych.org. The views or product endorsements expressed do not represent the views, support, or endorsements of STP. Psych Sessions is so grateful to have STP as a long-term supporter. We know you want to reach every student in your course to help every student individually succeed. But how do you find out what each student wants and needs? Macmillan Learning's Achieve for Psychology offers a solution. Ask them. Achieve puts goal setting and reflection surveys in each course where students share their aspirations, thoughts, and concerns about what they are trying to learn. Their responses help you tailor lessons and assignments and addresses both individual and class-wide needs. See for yourself. Go to macmillanlearning.com forward slash psych sessions for an introductory tour today. Macmillan's Achieve for Psychology, engaging every student, supporting every instructor, setting the new standard for teaching and learning. All right, so... Welcome to another episode of Psych Sessions. They're all special, just like all children. They're, every episode is special, and this is another special episode for multiple reasons. We're here at ACT in Portland in October of 2023. Thank you to Lindsay Maslin and ACT folks, STP, for hosting us. Not only do we have a special guest, we have a special guest host. So I'm here with Ken Barron from James Madison University. Hi, Ken. Hi, Eric. And our special guest host, Jane Hallinan from the University of West Florida. Hi, Jane. Hi, Eric. All right. Now that we've got the pleasantries out of the way, let the games <laughs> begin. All right. So I think we need to let our audience get to know Ken a little bit. Ken, how long have you been at JMU? So I started at JMU in 2000. So this is year 24 for me. Year 24. You know, there's a comedian that has a joke when they ask about uh, how long a person's been married. 
The comedian comes back with, you know you can get out of it, right? <laughs> so you've been there 24 years. Was that your first job post-PhD? So I stayed, I got my PhD at University of Wisconsin in Madison, and then I stayed for a year okay. as a visiting professor, and then this was my first tenure track job. Your first tenure track job. And help me with the trajectory, Jane. When Jane was at, Jane was at JMU, except her name was slightly different. Her name was Jane X. Hallinan, not Jane S. Hallinan. Were, were you, I don't, I, I can't. I don't know the timeline. Were you the chair when Ken was hired? I was. The plot thickens. <laughs> All right. So let's go there. Okay. Do you remember hiring Ken? I do really well. Can you talk about that? I can. Um, one of the things I most enjoy about being an administrator is I have a really good spidey sense about talent. And I remember during the interview, he dazzled me. And I don't dazzle easily in interviews like that, but I just knew at the conclusion of our discussion that this is somebody I wanted to work with. And as it turned out, we had a really talented pool. That year, we were able to hire two really great people, both of them dazzling people. And so I, I was right, clearly, because he's had a, a brilliant career at JMU. So... When you're dazzled twice, is that being bedazzled? <laughs> Are you familiar with bedazzling? Yeah. Okay. And Ken, who was the other person that was hired in your cohort? Monica Reese Bergen. And you're, you're both there 24 years later. We were both there 24 years later. All right, so help me out here. Sometimes there are couples who are married, but they don't have the same last name. You two aren't married, are you? We are not. Okay, all right. I just want to, I'm sorry. I just, no, they're not. I didn't want to step in something and go, <laughs> oh, you've been there both the exact same time. <laughs> That's because we're married, doofus. I mean, I could be doofus in other ways. They're friends. They're good friends. So let, let, let's go backwards, if you don't mind. University of Wisconsin-Madison. Fantastic campus, by the way. I agree. Amazing campus. I was, my first three years were at University of wisconsin Platteville. And I got to spend a couple of segments of time at the Madison campus. And, you know, was it the Ross Geller that was in the basement of the Memorial Hall? Memorial Hall, where, where a college campus that sold beer in the 1980s, 1990s, which was, you know, a good thing, even for a college professor. I remember going to the library on the Madison campus. And at that time, you could walk in and go to the stacks, and go to the first edition of every psychology journal. It wasn't behind something. You didn't have to ask for permission. So you could go to the first edition of the American Journal of Psychology in 1890 and walk right straight to it, and take it to a copy machine and make copies. I, I love that. Who did you study with? What did you study in grad school? What was your specialty? It's an excellent question. So I didn't know I should have a topic when I went to graduate school. And we had a novel way in Wisconsin. We didn't get selected to work under a particular mentor. Instead, we had a first-year advisor. So we went and interviewed with all the social... I was a social psychologist slash personality psychologist in that program. So we would interview with each of the respective social slash personality psychologists, put in our top three who we'd want to work with our first year, and then they supposedly put in their top three, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a kind of a rush for who, who you'd be with. And my first advisor was Patricia Devine, who studies prejudice and reduction processes. Okay. Fantastic person, but it wasn't necessarily my calling yet. Especially to be in an experimental social psychology lab was not my calling yet. And loved being a grad student of coursework, loved having a chance to teach because I went to a small liberal arts school and that was my identity. I think of a faculty member. I went to Bucknell University. In Pennsylvania? In Pennsylvania. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I started on the East Coast, was born, bred, and raised, never moved out of the same house, but then I got highly motivated to kind of start getting away from Delaware. Didn't get that far for, for undergrad to Bucknell, but then grad school, I just, again, just applied to Pac-10, Big Ten schools, thinking all social psychology programs were the same. Uh, there'll be a plot line here. I didn't really seek out mentoring, didn't know I should seek out mentoring, and so I think I went into it fairly blind. I had a lot of unknown unknowns, let's put it that way. The Dunning-Kruger effect was 
was very rampant in my background. Are we going to stop him at some point putting himself down or are we going to just let uh, him? I, just let it slide. Okay. okay. Let, let it go for now. Because you, you know the story. I don't. Well, I'm, I'm going to. You might know some of it. I'm not sure you know all this. Yeah, well, yeah. go ahead and share. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, I think it's context setting. I don't think I'm putting myself down either, actually. Okay, good. And it's my mission now to right the wrong that I live with my current student slash advisee. So, and I'm sitting across from a table from somebody that did provide me mentoring in a novel way for the first time in my career too. So it's a pleasure for me to share this story. Um, but going back to my first year project mentor, she was wonderful because I was ready to drop out after my first year because I was trapping P less than 0.05 or felt I was trying to trap P less than 0.05 in pilot study after pilot study to get my first year project to work. This is a very stressful thing to do to a first year graduate student that you have a first year project rather than a master's thesis. You have to present it to the entire psychology department in April of your first year. You've never seen them. And again, I never saw research done at Bucknell, so it was eye opening. Oh, really? Hmm. We had few faculty talking about it. I didn't see people actually engaging in it. So you never went to an EPA or an MPA? Never. So what, so then at the undergraduate, what was the interest of in going to graduate school? Um, it was never modeled for you? Well, it was modeled in a different way. So even to back up a little bit. So my dad was the first generation to go to college on either side of my family. And uh, my mom never did. She was trained basically. She never had a college prep track. She was trained to be a secretary. And my dad went to the University of Maryland. So he went to the state school. He was just trying to get out of the coal mine or get off uh, a farm and be the first person. And, you know, again, the extended family to do that. And uh, Wilkins Reeve was his undergraduate advisor that, again, I like to honor Wilkins Reeve because he changed my dad's life. That's changed my life because my dad, April, was getting married to my mom his senior year. Wilkins Reeve said, hey, Gene, my dad's name, what are you doing next year? Oh, I'm just going to go back. And I had a summer internship the summer for senior year. I'm just going to go get our first job, uh, that quote, unquote, the white collar, not the blue collar kind of job. And he said, why don't you stay and be my grad student? So my dad, never thinking he would go to grad school, that wasn't on his radar, got a PhD in chemistry. And so moved first of our extended family to move away from where everybody else lived and just had a whole different trajectory. And my parents always valued education. And I think even the plot line, that was just the next thing you do for upward social mm -hmm. mobility. It was modeled for me. And so my sister and I both went that way. She was older. She went to med school, did the med school professor thing. But I just knew I wanted expertise. I never expected to be a professor. That was never on the radar. And then even the psych is an interesting story because if you grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, it's known as the chemical capital of the world because of many major corporations, chemical corporations centered, or at least historically centered there, like DuPont. My dad worked for the DuPont company. And so most of us grew up as kids of chemists or chemical engineers. So that thing STEM was pretty, pretty prevalent. Things like psych or a field of something of social science was not something that was talked around the dinner table typically. But then I had philosophy my senior year that rocked my world. Got me to think about things that I'd never seen or heard of and purpose, meaning, you know, all that kind of stuff. So then I did a huge pivot when I went to Bucknell and then decided to go down the road. I think we're going to talk about learning communities later, but I joined a complete, I did a opposite action, 180, and I joined a humanities learning community of all things, which was shocking. And actually probably scary to my father that I find out many years later that he thought STEM career was a guaranteed paycheck. So to go this thing psych, he was confused by that for a while. So there's so many things I want to unpack there. The the one thing that that, that triggers for me in a positive way, at what age were you interested in acquiring expertise? What a great question. You know, it's a one always asked me that. I think I think I've always aspired to like to master stuff without having that terminology in my head. But I do remember you take me back to an activity. So I took a college student success class my senior year. We had to do this activity. We we're given like 20 attributes you'd want. And we were all given like $100 play dollars. And you got to put down like for that attribute, how much are you willing to gamble or bet? And I put like it all in on expertise. 
So for whatever reason, that point, all I mean, in senior year is just being able to master something and know it. I guess it's always something that's intrigued me. Ken, where do you think that came from? I mean, the, I, I, I'm not a developmental psychologist, so I, I, I can't speak to how rare that is. That strikes me as rare. Well, you're 17, 18 years old, right? Senior in high school. And you're um, going, oh my, of all the things, you, you know, <laughs> if I think back to me, I want to be a baseball player. <laughs> I want to play basketball for the Chicago Bulls. Ken Barron, I want expertise. Well, I wanted to do all those things too, potentially. Okay. I mean, like expertise is generic at this point. So right. whether it's okay. a sport, I, I did try to dabble in that as well. And I played college soccer when I was there too, for example. But, but no, I think it's, yeah. I mean, right now I'm trying to work on my latte art. So expertise is something that has not ended. <laughs> you're, you're, you mean with the pour I, and then with the stick the that current, goes through? You know, lifelong learning. That's my current thing I'm working on. I've got the I, rosette. I've got a heart. I can't do a tulip yet. So. I, is my leg being pulled under the no, table? No, it's not. He's actually, he, he, he's a latte artist. If he says that that's what I'm he's doing, on my that's what he's art. doing. <laughs> I don't know if I would say I'm an artiste yet, but I'm okay, aspiring I, I, to be. I'm sorry, I pronounced it wrong. <laughs> wow. All right. So usually I like to ask the question, but I already think I know the answer to my own question. I normally ask the question growing up, was the question, will you go to college or what college will you go to? But it sounds like the answer was you are going to college since your dad went to college. That was never a question, right? I always was going to go to college. The interesting thing in Delaware, you have one university, and it was 40 minutes from my house, University of Delaware, but I had somebody plant the seed of this thing called a small liberal arts college. And that, of course, if you buy the tagline, large institution, you'll be a number, small liberal arts school, you won't be a number. But I went to a small liberal arts school and realized you can be a number there too. And mm -hmm. I never went to anybody's house for lunch or dinner. I never called a professor by the first name. In our, I agree with you, yeah. In, our, yeah. in my experience, not that it didn't happen on our campus. And even actually the, the interesting thing, the thought of becoming a college professor didn't hit me until I'm going back to the April. I guess it's a, a momentous occasion for my dad. It was a momentous occasion for me. It was April of my senior year. It was the first time I thought about it. And even that was kind of vicarious because my, my, one of my close college friends it's my roommate for many years. We'd play one of his professors in, in uh, squash or racquetball. I forget what the sport was. And would always try to say, you know, to my friend, you should do this thing. It's, this is a great gig to be a college professor. So I vicariously, I think I, I got into that. But I also had a chance to TA and I did an independent project my senior year and that kind of sealed the deal. And I found social psych. What, uh, what course did you TA for? I TA social psych. Okay. But I, you know, I switched majors four times. I mean, I had a lot of... What, what was the path? When I went to, well, when I, when I went into undergrad, if you had asked me then what grad school I would have gone to, I said I was going to say law school. And I think it was the philosophy, pursuit of truth, right, right. all that kind of stuff. And of course, what do you major in if you're going to go to law school? Philosophy. Philosophy. Of course not. It's political science, right? That's what I thought. Oh. Again, being naive. I, okay. Not that I ever asked anybody about this. I just, so I was first a political science major. I officially never had a political science class. I think the only one I was signed up for my first year, I ended up dropping to switch to something else. But, but then I went into psychology and, but I started having doubts sophomore year about what this thing learning was. So it's actually funny that you say that. Nobody's ever asked me about the mastery. I think sophomore year, I had my epiphany that I was doing things for achievement and I study motivation. We might get into that. And I was really good at performance goals. I was really good at, you know, you know, put me against somebody else. I will compete and um, I'll try to strive to be better than as a referent or, you know, society likes those things. I got rewarded a lot early on to whether it's a grade or something that happened on a playing field or a sport field. But for some reason around sophomore year, it just kind of left me wanting that that wasn't really what it was all about. But I didn't realize effort and mastery of something was another sidebar. And that in and of itself was the ride. I'm going to stop right here and say thank you for bringing Ken to this interview today. You're I, welcome. I'm having a good time. <laughs> Ken, I have an awkward question for you. As a kid, and maybe today, first off, I have an observation and a question. You live in your head, don't you? You do a lot of self-reflection and introspection. You, I mean, is that fair to say? 
I would say many of us are trying to figure out why people do what they do. No, I think (laughs) I I think you have a PhD and living in your head. I I mean, and that's not a criticism. Yeah. I mean, but to me, tell me if this is fair to say. There were times in your childhood and maybe your young adulthood that you kind of tormented yourself. I mean, the the change in majors and should I do this and should I do that? And I think every student these days does, does that. And I changed my major four times, three times. But you, I, I hear angst. I hear stories of angst that you, you kind of, you know, I self questioned and I, and maybe you're just remembering it better. Maybe I've just, maybe I've just blocked it out. Did I mention you would be getting an analysis out of this? And I don't have any training in that. So (laughs) let let me give the disclaimer. The interesting thing too, if you have a chance to be on our campus, I have, and I have been on your campus. I have lots of bumper stickers on my door. And one of them you're making me now think of not all who wander are lost. I, uh, and I, I would agree with that. And I say that one and and it resonates to me. I don't think it was angst yet then. I think okay. it was the journey. And I think it was really just things that got opened to my, you know, my eyes got open when I took philosophy just to realize that people around the world think very differently than the, than my upbringing. So let me rephrase it. I think you're deeply self-reflective. Yeah. And I would say, generally speaking, more deeply than most people I have met. And the thing that even some of my major switching changes, I thought undergrad at a small of our school is going to be better. And I, ah, the, the, okay. it's not so much I had angst. Okay. I, I would more I said I had anger, possibly a frustration. Okay. That this isn't the thing that I thought it was. It was bait and switch. Well, you got yeah, promised it, something yeah. that didn't get delivered. And, and interestingly, I watched people deal with that differently. And again, I had a, my close friend who played, I just shared earlier, who played with squash with one of his professors. We both went through sort of a sophomore slump. And so, again, I end up going into motivation, but these terms made a lot of sense. It wasn't, the honeymoon was over. The first year was great, but the ride is like, this is all this is? This could be better. And that was playing soccer. Where I went, it was 70% Greek. That was just how that campus socialized. And is this what it should be? And what I didn't probably appreciate, that that was all the groundwork to being somebody that was aspiring to want to say the situation is radical in causing and controlling their behavior. That was the plant, the seed of being a social psychologist without me knowing it. But did you know that you were in the sophomore slump while you were a sophomore? Well, I knew that at that point I didn't want to go to grad school anymore. So then I switched my major to business because that's what you do to get a, I I just came out of the session that, well, our rapid round talk over lunch about there's nothing you can do with a BS or BA. I bought that that line. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I'll go to a, a major that I can get a job right away. So I went to business. But that was a great wander because quickly after your semester of being a business coursework, coursework, I realized going back to your point, I like to think. And I didn't want to just make money. Yeah. I think a lot of people have a sophomore slump. I just don't think they realize that while they're still a sophomore, they're not so, they're not deeply they don't have that reflective spirit that I think you have that they know that they're not having a good experience. I went to a small private liberal arts school for four years in the middle of Illinois, central Illinois, and I had an amazing experience. And I was on a campus with 65% Greek, and I was in the Greek system. And I did not, ha- and I did research and blah, blah, blah. I went to MPA. I went to MPA in 1985 while I was an undergraduate. And I had, I think what I had the, was the opposite of your experience. And I tried to recreate, I try still to this day, try to recreate that for my students. Right. Sadly, that is, you, I had the slack experience that you did not have at Bucknell, small liberal arts college. Sure. Yeah. They're not all created equally. I mean, and, and sadly, even, even my reflection of Bucknell, when I started going on the job market, I thought I would go back to a small liberal arts school. So, and I realized I didn't look. I looked at, you know, University of Delaware and I applied to two other schools that were near us. And we had deep family friends that were sort of my second set of parents that both graduated from Bucknell. So Bucknell held some other ideal to me that I really respected them. I said, well, if I can go there, they turned out pretty okay. (laughs) That was another poll. So it wasn't like I did this broad sweeping investigation of what these things were. And I didn't, again, my dad first gen didn't know what that was. My mom didn't know what these things were. And mentoring is going to be a theme that comes back. I didn't have a lot of mentoring. I thought I, I thought I was doing what I needed to do by just, you know, checking off boxes. Did you finally find mentoring at Wisconsin, or did you not get it until you got to Harrisonburg? Well, I think the switch for me, sophomore year, and it wasn't even then, I just realized that I went back to psych. 
but I still was, here's the switch. I was still being reactive to what I was seeing in the classroom. I had a professor who called me out because she saw potentially something in me in a research methods class, but, you know, I was like, eh, I wasn't engaging. And so when I was in her office hours, I said, what do you want to do, Ken? I said, well, I always thought I'd go to grad school. And this is the only thing she said. She said, well, how do you think you're going to get there? And she just like dropped the mic and just this, and it just hit me. It's like, what am I doing? So I went from being reactive thinking, what am I doing proactively? So my last three semesters, I totally changed and started to engage and seek things out. And that was the game changer for me. But I also didn't apply to school right away. I took a, a, a gap year between undergrad and grad just to let myself absorb and take advantage of. So I did an independent research project with a professor, but it was more, it was me driving. It wasn't part of a research team or research lab. I never thought you could go to conferences. It's not something I wrote up formally for anybody, but just for that experience. He asked me to TA with him the following semester in social psych. And that's when it sort of planted the seed that this could be a good gig. I want to go back to the mic drop moment. Yeah. Now as a teacher, when you look back on that moment, do you think she was doing that as an intentional intervention or was it just a casual comment that just happened to hit you at the right time? I've never asked her that question. Interestingly, sort of what I'd say we talking about, we're in bringing in an inclusive, inviting environment. I didn't feel that from our professors because I felt the titles were really important, which became a barrier for students to feel safe to go interact. So it was more of a, you know, not warm and fuzzy versus cold and prickly to use that little child story. This particular professor was somebody I continued to stay close contact through grad school and actually re would reflect back on because even when I was thinking about applying to smaller art schools, but I never asked her. That's a good question, Jane. I should. If she was intentional or if that was just something that happened that hit me when I needed it. So JIT, just in time teaching, that was kind of my just in time JITA, my just in time advising moment for me. Um, well, I asked that in part because I'm, I'm aware that. Sometimes I'm very intentional, purposeful in how I craft my language to get a particular effect. Sure. And then sometimes I'll hear, you had this effect when I had no clue that I was having an effect. And so I, I was curious about how purposeful that might have been. But I, again, I didn't know you could have grad school paid for. So I, I moved home. I was like, okay, I'll move home, make money, study for the GREs. And all grad schools in social psych use the same textbooks, right? I didn't know there should be mentors. I didn't even know the difference between a mentor cohort model. So when I went, it was interesting and fortuitous where I ended up that you could slide into that. And so even when I realized I didn't find my calling yet in that area of research, I think it's incredibly important that I was ready to drop out. So I did have mentoring there. I'd say when I said really quality mentoring, don't drop out, apply for leave of absence. So I did. And I did, again, something I thought, well, maybe I needed a more practitioner-oriented career. So I went, I had done an experience with Outward Bound to do outdoor wilderness adventure leading of trips for, to, I was interested in the concept of self-esteem in college. I was like, this is a great thing. Are we building self-reliance and self-esteem by using these outdoor initiatives? So I was like, okay, now I have a time to do it. I'll go get trained on how to do that. Again, it was a wander, but an incredible, important wander for me to realize how that side of the world might be and why I needed to go back to grad school. There's a model, Three Worlds of Science. Have either of you heard of this model? So it's fun. I always teach research methods and statistics. And to me, I got to see this through that my first, first year advisor in grad school. So I, I'm indebted to her. But the model is simply this. There's a real world that we do research in. There's the theory world and there's the actual research world. So three worlds of science. The ideal is that a scientist would play in all three. You'd start in the real world to observe phenomena. That would then connect you to the theory world to kind of theorize what's happening with those observations. But we're not going to stop there because that would be philosophy. We're going to go into the research world to design a study, collect and analyze the data, which then connects us back to the theory world to say, do we find support for that theory? Or do we need to modify that theory? And so we are going to keep working on that, as we know, between those two worlds till we have evidence-based theory. Then what should we ideally do? Go back to the real world and apply. Okay, so what's interesting about that, Ken, is that 
I don't know if this is an insight or not, or maybe it's an insight for me and it doesn't matter to anybody else. You love that model because I think it reflects your brain and how you live. The problem is the rest of us only live in one of those worlds. But the ideal thing and is that can we play in all three? And I think, and I that's think my you message. do. And the, well, that's my message to from day one for my students in my research methods class because I teach them this within the second week of the semester of research methods class. Right. But, but what I'm saying is that you had graduate school mentors that only played in one of those worlds and you had undergrad mentors who only played in one of those worlds and you were a young student who was craving, whether you knew that about that model or not, you needed all three of those worlds because you bounced back and forth. 100%. And maybe that was part of, I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, dissatisfaction, angst, anxiety, anger, uneasiness, maybe. Uneasiness. So I write a lot about validity. And what's interesting... Because that's a hot topic that's selling books right off the shelves these <laughs> days, right? Validity? Well, it should. Validity.com. I subscribe to that I website, we have an by APA the way. goal for it, by the way, too. <laughs> right? My experience being frustrated, being tr again, I say this, in an experimental lab that I felt, where's the external validity in this? We are trying to control to control to trap P less than 0.05 to test this theoretical idea. That made me want to drop out of grad school. And by the way, I also got to take a class on how to be a social psychologist and read papers in the defense of, invo of external invalidity, that that's okay to do, but that wasn't okay for me to do. So then I decided that's why maybe I should go do this other experience. But when I went to go work with Outward Bound, then I got to realize they didn't have construct validity. They don't know what... They <laughs> they want to do this thing called self-esteem, but they don't even have a definition of it. And when you talk to your boss about that, how'd that go over? Well, interestingly, and then they don't necessarily, do they know cause and effect with internal belief? Well, I asked them, I said, how, I, I realized I was starting to ask those annoying questions. Like, well, how do we measure this? Because you're saying you're trying to change people's lives, not just now, but down the road. And so lifelong changes that this, they're on their brochures, that's on their website, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I knew I was tainted enough having measured self-esteem as a senior in college. But I asked them, so what do you get? They said, well, we get letters because you usually go on a trip with 12, you have 12 students, two mentors or trip leaders to lead you. It's like, okay, well, how many letters do you get back? Oh, three or four a year. No, it's like one out of a group. Well, one out of a group. Oh, okay. So, uh, and then it made me realize that again, do I feel good about, they don't have external validity either. So point being is my, Eric, that I'm like, okay, there's a lot I don't know. And this is maybe the whole mastery is like, I'll go back to grad school, learn the tools. And then actually I did in my mind say, I will figure out, thank you. I'll figure out what world to play in. And I did actually say it to my head intentionally then, but I needed to get the tools. So interestingly, and I'll, when I started teaching research methods, I'll write it big, but we don't play in all three. There's usually a barrier between the real world and then the theory research world. And we have labels for people on the, the left that just play in the real world. They could be Liberal a lay, a lay conservative. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> a lay person or practitioner. And then who's on the right? Who plays in the theory research world? The academic or the researcher. So my thing would I take my eraser because Jane knows this. I don't use PowerPoint. At least I, you saw me probably do chalk because we saw the chalkboards when what, Jane was what? there. But, now we've got whiteboards. So I would erase that and say, this is my goal, that you're going to continue to read your, even if you don't do research literature, 10, 20 years from now, you're still able to access it and feel that you're a student of your field. Again, maybe there's that mastery theme. But then after hanging out my research community that I play in, I got more and more frustrated. They're not coming into the real world. They're not observing what problems in my area that I would get into as motivation. What are the motivational hot topics that we need to be solving? not trapping the theoretical ideas that we've been thinking about for 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the research literature, but are we observing? And then more importantly, once you have an, a theory that you've empirically supported, are you seeing, does it actually hold up when you apply it, when you do lose all the control to see it in the real world? I think Ken Barron's the most well-adjusted person I've ever met. <laughs> because for someone who's so intellectually frustrated, he's a very happy fellow. I, just, I was just looking at his expression to see if that would endorse what you just said. I, 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 I'm not really looking for yeah. endorse. I'm looking more for your endorsement <laughs> than his. Well, I, he's going to disagree with me. I was just thinking that 
how he's responding is very parallel to how he responded in the job interview, that the depth of his answers, very different than you'd see in most um, job interviews. And I, I would imagine that the assistant professors at the time at JMU, if he, if he was him, if he was him now, then would have been intimidated. If I'm a second or third year assistant professor yeah. and I'm watching Ken Barron on his job interview, I'm saying to myself, oh, crap. They're, gonna, they're about to hire someone younger than me, smarter than me. Oh, crap. Well, I'm proud to say that at the time, that was not my experience with the JMU faculty. That Out loud. Yeah. No, the, the lion's share of the collegiality that we had at JMU during that era, um, if people felt that, I never experienced any feedback about that. There was just more excitement about acquiring these two extraordinarily talented people. And, you know, as a, as a recovering chair. <laughs> I am in recovery. Yeah, as a recovering chair, that this is such an important decision because you're, you're committing a department potentially to someone's lifelong position. It's the most important decision Most important that decisions makes. that you make. And so, indeed. you know, we scored big in getting these two really great people. So people were just really excited. They were not threatened at all. They were thrilled. And this is going to be a weird time warp thing that won't make sense when this episode comes out. But we're here in October, and on the, this coming Tuesday, which will actually be months, months ago, in the past. episode 184 with Monica Reesberg, and will correct. be released four days from now, which was actually months ago when you hear this. So I can tell you another funny story about the two of us. Please. Uh, Who are not married. We are not married. We are still <laughs> we're married to our respective spouses. And you're still we, not married. We came to, yeah, exactly. We applied for a lot of the same jobs because we were looking for sort of applied social psych jobs. We were both sitting on offers from the University of Montana. And I turned that offer down first. Did you? I don't know if you've I, ever heard yeah, this story. I think I knew that. Yeah. And had a very gracious, gracious chair say, I totally understand because you grew up on the East Coast. My wife. We were pregnant with our first child, be near family then, because I was very nervous to say no to a job, as one can imagine. And I was waiting, and I kept them waiting to get the offer from JMU. Monica was their second candidate. And, they, he and, and this particular chair said, oh, where are you going to go? I said, James Mass University. So can you imagine that Monica's their second candidate? And Monica said, I'm going to go to JMU, and then you can imagine that chair was then yeah, with, probably pretty not not probably not pretty happy. perturbed not as yeah, pleasant not happy. to 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 Monica's maybe he didn't ask Monica where are you going to go when when she turned him down oh she did uh, he did oh he, he did so no that's when he got frustrated to lose two candidates to the same institution yeah well start ma paying better you know yeah better package but you know well i think at the time the driver even though we were really we were just looking for one person our needs in the research methods area were intense enough that I did some magical moving of lines around that I later paid for. With a demotion. Well, no, that's another story. In effect, I was kind of trading on the fact that I knew someone was going to retire soon and I was counting on the return of that line and we didn't get that line when the person retired. And so that ended, that kind of ended IO psychology at JMU because I doubled down on having good methods people because I just didn't want to lose either of those people. You know, it's a good to, <clears throat> it's good to know when you can take the risk and get away with it. You know, it's well, I, that was a kind of a temporary got away with it. So, I mean, my endurance at JMU, I was not there as long as I might have liked to have been. Let's put uh, it that oh, way. Oh, wow. That was the beginning of here's your hat, what's your hurry? It might have been the it might have been a, a signal that I wasn't reading the provost as as clearly as I should have been. Wow. And you know, Ken is going, That's right, Jane. <laughs> I won't say I knew that then, but Yeah. 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 So Ken, let's let's jump forward. And th by the way, thank you for being so patient with these pesky questions and these attempt the attempts at insight into your life that you already know I'm wrong and I'm just playing Sigmund here, so thank. I appreciate well, actually, it you're giving much. me new insights on in the moment, so I'll, I'll reserve them. Uh, I think I'm living a life of mashup because I've always wanted to mash up the three worlds. Jane knows something else that I always wanted to mash up is academic affairs and student affairs. So, 
There's a lot of mashups. Well, they're, you know, those two things really are much more separate than they should be at most college campuses. Absolutely. You know, and so, so let, let's jump forward. And so can you talk a little bit about your current research? And because I think you have an expertise in a topic that most faculty members do not. And we have data on that. <laughs> and, and can you talk about that? If, Why if, isn't if, that a surprise? <laughs> yes. Exactly. And I'll bet you have data from the real world, from the academic world, and from the other world. Yeah. So, yeah. No, so my area, when I took my leave and came back, I switched research labs because then again, that lesson learned being reactive and then realizing that life is better lived being proactive, that I proactively said, ah, who would, what would be the research area? So then I went into the area of motivation which something that spoke to me on lots of levels, what is achievement, motivation academically, and then having lived a life of playing sports for a long time for that, et cetera. So. Can I just intervene here for a second? Because you are talking to someone who's publicly said in multiple occasions that I never teach the chapter on motivation. Yeah, I got to I got to tell you. So, you know, what, first off, I'm not using an intro psych textbook anymore. Sure. Um, but when I did, like all good acolytes do, out of the 16 chapter textbook, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. I, I, I never taught, I'm not saying that there aren't important topics in it. I'm not saying that there aren't topics that students wouldn't enjoy. I teach in a 15 week semester. And so if you're doing a chapter a week, you cannot teach every chapter in the book. And I, I don't think in my entire career I've ever taught motivation. He brags about it, actually. Okay, I don't brag about it. I just, I, it's a kind of a funny line. And I, I every time I say it, I hear a couple of, it's like you don't teach, mo because there are people who are passionate about yeah. it. And I, if I if I took out gender and sexuality, they would go, mm. I would hear That's the, true. the same you, gas. Whatever you, you chose know, would burn If I said brain well. and behavior, I'd get, you know, sticks and stones and pitchforks and, you know, and tridents, you know, so. Let's see if I can do a little case study of chapters of a textbook and then see if I can sell you. Okay? I, I, I was so, sore you were going to say rehabilitation. <laughs> that's what I was expecting. Let's yeah, see if I, I can sell you this. It's so, in store. Um, Hans Selye. Let's start there. Let's start there. And we'll see. Maybe I can sell you on it. Three worlds of science. We've set that up. Yes, we okay. have. But also the power of teaching and doing research at the same time. So I had, and then actually trying to do professional development with practitioners for the first time. So this is 2005 for me. So I had my first time that I started to lead professional development workshops on motivation as I was teaching a senior capstone on motivation. As I was going to now five years, I stopped going to APA events because a lot of the motivation research community goes to the American Educational Research Association. All the players are there and that was eye-opening to just be with that community. But also I had five years to see how far we were progressing or not as a community and gave me that insight. Are we staying on the theory research side? We're not coming and playing on the real world side. Well, how much time do I get <laughs> to talk to a group about motivation? Because that's really powerful. You get 12 minutes plus three minutes for questions. Well, that's usually you get two hours, but for a workshop or an hour, that 30 minutes. But the point is that I started thinking about what theories I'm going to include, what theories I'm going to cut out. That was my, my mindset. And even... I didn't realize, and I'll use a religious metaphor, I was in a, in a, in a religion of motivational theory, because that's what we did in our grad program, versus if you went to grad school X, Y, or Z, it might be another discipline, right? We're in our lanes of different theoretic orientations. We're not synthesizing. So then what's a great thing we often do to undergraduates? Oh, synthesize our field for us as your capstone project. But are we synthesizing within our communities? So... This event at AERA, well, I'll never forget. It's going to come back to the chapter here for a minute. We had a combined um, session between the group that sponsors pre-service teachers with our research community and motivation. And the topic was, what should pre-service teachers know about current theory and research and motivation? Three worlds of science. We're coming together. We set up, sent up three of our experts and three dominant frameworks of the day, which only had 10 minutes each to say, what do you should tell all teachers would want to know in, in 10 minutes about your theory? But then we had an Ed Psych textbook, famous instructor, talk about how she presented and thinks about motivation, and then made a famous textbook writer, and then a recent graduate, and then who was in the field teaching. But the textbook author is the quote that I'll never forget. It changed my life. 
She said, of all the chapters in my ed psych textbook, and she's saying this to a group of motivation researchers across the, you know, the U.S. and world, uh, of all the chapters that I have to write in my ed psych textbook, I hate writing your chapter the most. You have 48 plus or minus eight theories, and that's the thing I've never forgotten. Mm. You've got constructs that seem different, but actually mean the same thing. And you've got constructs that sound really similar that actually mean different things. I don't know what the message should be. So I'm seeing Bloom's taxonomy in my head. What are we doing to analyze? What are we doing to evaluate? And what are we doing to create our more parsimonious framework for more people to have in their back pocket? Okay. So that's where my career has been with motivation is being student of all these different frameworks to say, can we simplify? And so now when I go out to do a professional development event, I don't care how many hours you give me. Because if you give me literally a ride in an elevator, I'm going to give you one formula and that's it. And then even we literally, I had a, we did this, Jane will know this school. We had a project in the Shenandoah Valley to do bridging STEM, to try to infuse STEM faculty to get to know techniques. And we had a chemistry professor after our workshop said, I'm going to write your formula down on a post-it note, stick it on my computer monitor to remind me and my motivation planning each week, each day of my class with this framework of three things, which I'd say, that's great. You can, everything I, I know you can put on a post-it note to keep it that simple. Because I do think it's potentially that simple because we've been playing in the three worlds and we honored the research theory world, but we added a letter that came from the real world. But you understand that intro psych textbook authors aren't doing that. They're part of the cause of dumping a lot of things not to synthesize. So here's my point about teaching motivation. If you can motivate your students, guess what they're going to read after your class is over? Those other chapters you may not have been able to teach. What are we doing when, the, when the, again, the lights are off and they now have that book? Are they going to sell it? Or are they going to keep it? So we actually honoring motivation to motivate the next generation to care about they can do it. They want to do it. And you said you have some data. So when we often do events, we always start, a, I've got a stock sort of PD initial thing. Give me a motivational problem that if we could solve today, what would it be? You can give me two. Like a good use of our time. Two, right now, do you have any strategies you're trying? And if you don't, put a question mark. Let's honor that. Three, oh, by the way, do you remember any framework, theory, or model that you might have learned? And if you do, tell me, you know, what the name of it. Maybe it's linked to an author or a theorist or not. Again, let's honor it. Put a question mark. And again, I said, if you're putting question marks, I'm blaming us today because the theory research crowd has let you down. We have not given you, again, now you see the three worlds of science. You're right. I live it constantly. We're not giving you a tool that you can easily apply. So I've yet to be in a room and this was a STEM focus, the best I ever saw for college faculty. We got to 20% could name a framework. And this was at a very STEM teaching focused conference. But even of what they named are not things that I would want to say these, these should be in your toolbox. Yeah. And it certainly was not a dynamic framework that would give you all the tools in your toolbox you would want to need to better serve more students more of the time. Well, to persuade him, you're probably going to have to go to a bar over drinks to give him a longer term discussion. But I know we need to save a little bit of time for you to talk about learning communities in psychology. Sure. Since that's one of your claims to fame. Can you talk a little bit about how that got started? Well, I had a mentor sitting across from me who actually asked me, what do I want out of my career? Nobody had ever asked me that. It's a big question. I don't remember having a grad advisor ask me, what do you want out of your career? Because they wanted you to be them. Yes. And Often I didn't want to be just a researcher. I cared. I mean, again, I came from a model of teaching, but then I think I came from a model of being part of a community and want to change a, a community to shape all of us. Jane asked me what I wanted to be. And I said, I don't know. I don't know if you remember my answer. I said, I don't know. Can I ask at what point? Was that like two years into your career? It was a, 10 years after you met? Was that early, middle, late? I mean, was that like 10 days after he got his I'm job? Say early. Okay. It was first, definitely in the first year. I don't know if it was oh, part wow. of our formal first That's faculty impressive. evaluation meeting. It might have been. I that, think it was that would make sense. possibly around yeah. that. That's impressive. Thank but you. Jane heard, and I said, I don't know. Again, so I'm not like on a fixed thing. I'm like life of wonder. And it's not you're not lost. But I did know, I thought, oh, maybe, I, I don't know if you remember, I said this, maybe dean of students, because I wanted to be part of running, helping the whole idea of a campus community, because I was an RA too, as an undergrad. I saw all the bad 
the somewhat good, but the real ugly of being in a, being a fraternity I was in one of those, which come back to the learning community to live together, et cetera. So Jane asked, and maybe that planted a seed because then she got pitched from a, a new initiative, JMU, to create learning communities that were discipline-based. And I don't know if you knocked on anybody else's door. You never actually told me that story. But, I did not. But she knew I was interested, potentially, so she knocked on my door, Student Affairs, Academic Affairs. Does this involve residential life? Because they're going to live in the same residence hall. Does it involve orientation? I was a first-year advisor, too. It's a special role at JMU. And then the academic um, side of the house, too, within the psych department. So the idea is, could we create a community in psychology? So this is in 2001. And interestingly, we debated a lot of things. Should this be an honors experience for students? Should this be quite the opposite? Students that we were worried about that would be at risk of, of making the successful transition. But then there was this little document brewing called APA Goals 1.0 that we happen to have inside information because Jane is leading this task force. And they said, aha, this is what this thing should be about. Let's make that our guiding document. And can we create coursework to start promoting growth and development on those 10 things? And we didn't have the idea of the two-year, four-year at that point at no, any that time. No, emerged in it was, it was just this idea, can we start the journey? But I had this big, strong background in student affairs, and then I had this course in college success. I said, I also know people like uh, Chickering and Gamson's Seven mm -hmm. Principles. I also knew about Aston's top three, meaningful peer-peer, meaningful faculty, student, and time on task. And I also lived that experience. I didn't know a single psych major buck now. I didn't know I should. We didn't interact in classes. We was a small major. I didn't have anybody in my soccer team, and there's nobody in my fraternity. I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't have faculty that I know that, that I realized I should be hanging out with and talking to. So part of that was that we had this nice colliding thing of having key college student success research literature within the APA goal document. So then we decided let's have research method and statistics be a jumping point. That knocks out a lot of goals back in the day when there were 10. You know, we got goal two, three, four, five, six, seven, that way. And then the idea we actually, interestingly, we partnered with Student Affairs to run a college success course, which they actually used Jane's book. But it didn't really meet our students' needs. And I kept hearing stories, it was taught by Student Affairs, that they were thinking this was something that wasn't of great value to them. And I remember my colleagues saying, man, you got to have your A game. They'll eat you alive. It's like, yeah, they live together. They can talk. Yeah. So then we decided to pivot rather than having an off-the-shelf college student success class. I said, let's do the same thing as but teach them in the context of psychology. So then we coined it orientation to the field of psychology and the major JMU. I was also their first-year advisor, transitional advisor. So it gave me not just the typical summer orientation, fall orientation activities, but now I had 15 weeks to hang out and think about developmental curriculum of mentoring and advising. Mentoring. I didn't get it. So now it's my chance to right the wrong, right? And part of that experience was then that helped us introduce goal one, content knowledge. So we actually had a chance that every year they would meet 20 to 25 different faculty to come talk about their field, how they got interested in their field, how could you get involved to also plant the seed. First semester, first year, how do you get engaged in this? And we have a thing that drew me to, to JMU. We have many different ways to do independent studies to get students right away involved, whether practitioner or research. That blew me away because nobody advertised that when I was, at, again, at Bucknell. The other thing I got to do, there's another mashup story here. We've been talking about research methods and stat. Should they be integrated? That's, that's a really hard thing to tackle with just pragmatically with students coming in and starting different semesters. I said, all right, if I'm going to teach them statistics and research methods, how about I try to integrate them because I've got basically a test laboratory. And that's where we started an integrated course at JMU that personally I would never go back ever because again, motivationally, when do we learn best? With context, with value. And when we teach stats, we are often teaching it out of context of what we do as a researcher. We think you need it to do research, but the point is you're not encoding it because you don't know why you want to do it, which is one of the letters of that motivational formula that I haven't given you yet. So it gave us a chance to really honor developmental growth on the 10 goals. We collected data on it. I had a colleague at one of the first best practice conferences, if you remember it, well, it wasn't the first because the first was on assessment. Yep. I think it might have been the third was on best practice in the beginning and endings of the psychology yep. major. I remember that one. And Kim Book at University of uh, North Carolina at one Charlotte. Of no, yeah. it's at Charlotte. Google. 
she, cause it turned out they started a psych, a psychology, we called it psychology learning community. They called it their psychology learning community. She Googled it and found like six in the country. So she reached out to me and that developed a partnership for us for that went on for many, many years to do collaborations and they were collecting data and they had a different model than we did because theirs wasn't residential. There was a curricular, but just that we were able to now show evidence based about again, surprise, surprise, put people in meaningful relationships. They get better mentoring. They start to engage mm-hmm. and do the things that we'd want them to do. And, uh, yeah. And is the status of the learning community in psychology at JMU, is it no longer in existence? Did it fade out? What happened? So I ran it for over 15 years. I think there was a, I was on a sabbatical one year. So there was a year gap year. So I think it was, yeah, 15 years that I did it partly to honor me doing more work away from JMU. I started to get some grant support to start working with K-12 and different higher ed divisions around the country. So I didn't have time to teach those three courses. So I stepped out. I had colleagues that took it over for two years. The pandemic hit. And so that kind of has put it on hold. And nobody, and now our major has grown, like many of our majors in numbers, and we can't staff. We have so much press on where we need to get classes taught that creatively trying to pull off the the second community, which is uh, brings tear to my eye, so yeah. to speak. Ken, I really appreciate your time. I'm going to start to bring us to a close to honor your time. Was, was there anything that you wanted to make sure that you wanted to mention that we haven't or bring up or do you want to file a complaint about this interview <laughs> that I was I was too impolite or put words in your mouth or file a retraction? Anything that you wanted to say? Well, I'll say you gave me an epiphany to honor the the colliding of things. So the other thing that I will share too, why I was appealed to go to JMU is that it helped me marry or merge a small liberal arts school environment that was focused on teaching, but with the resources of research, one school that I saw going finally to that for Wisconsin, uh, it allowed me to care and get valued for teaching service and scholarship, which we did. What's interesting, we're merging into, we just got labels in R2, so it'll be an, an interesting journey to watch what the JMU of the future is. But you've given me that epiphany. I think I do a lot of mashup. I like to play in lots of worlds. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And you, honestly, you seem you seem so excited and energetic for it. You you seem like you found your niche. You 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 found a place where you love. Your sandbox is full, and you love playing in the sand. And, and if if I, it's going to sound cliche. You're motivated to be happy there. Seriously, it's not a joke. Thanks for being on Psych Sessions. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. You're welcome.